Hi, I'm Bob Moon, senior pastor here at First Methodist Church in Valdosta, and I'm so glad that you joined us here today. Now, this is always shown a week later after it was taped, so I don't know what the weather's like where you are right now, whether it's raining or sunshine, but hang on because you're going to see an umbrella in the sermon coming up. So what on earth is a pastor doing with an umbrella inside the church? <laughs> well, if you want to know, you got to hang on and see. What we're talking about is this, though, that there's going to be hope in the midst of the downpour. So join with us today. We have a great service of worship. It is a service of hope. It is a service of life. It is a service that will say that no matter what it is you're experiencing, Jesus is there for you. Good morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Thank you. Well, this is a great day to be in the house of the Lord and to worship our Savior. We're glad that you have come from a variety of different places. We are honoring some of the uh, ladies in our church who have been United Methodist women for a while. And in this special celebration, I see you've brought a lot of family with you. And I want to just say to all of you, we are going to be doing this again next week, so come back. Uh, it's great to have you here, and always a celebration. Would you all, and I'd like to ask this of all of you, fill out your connection card, which you got in your bulletin, and give us uh, contact information. There's a place on the back where you can give prayer requests. We take that very seriously and pray over the things. Also, you see there's something uh, where we, you can order... Uh, Easter lilies on Easter Sunday. This place will be uh, filled with lilies that will uh, help us to worship in the beauty of holiness. And then you have another piece here of, uh, about the United Methodist women. If you will look on the back, you will find a disturbing picture of circle three in which two of the United Methodist women have beards. <laughs> so anyway, uh, if you have a, a, a if you are a bearded lady, you may want to consider Circle 3. Just kidding. Uh, there are uh, some guys there. They had the, this picture taken at the Wesley Foundation where they were meeting. God is doing a lot of fresh things, and we're excited about that. <coughs>
In this historic confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gracious Creator, in this moment we pause and center ourselves to be still and to know you are God. We rest in the depth of your love which exceeds our deepest longings. How grateful we are. There's nowhere we can go away from your spirit. There's nothing we can do to separate us from your loving presence. This is the faith we hold on to even when we don't see your hand or feel you near. Come to us today with your transforming power and your abundant life. Meet each of us at the point of our deepest needs. Open and soften our hearts to receive all that you have for us, for many are carrying heavy and challenging burdens, fears, and uncertainties. Fill us with that love that casts out all fear Touch us with your comfort, which heals our wounds, physical, emotional, and spiritual. Infuse us with your grace, restoring our souls, and with your joy, renewing our hope. You are the source of new and transformed life, new revelations, and new opportunities. Our certainty is in you, and we give you thanks. Our hearts break for your world, Lord for the violence, the injustice, and the losses. O oh God of mercy, let your steady hand guide all peoples and nations. Out of chaos and conflict, bring a harmony more perfect than we can conceive, a new humility and understanding, a renewed sense of truth, and a new hunger and thirst for your love to rule the earth. May your holy and life-giving spirit so move every human heart, the barriers which divide us may crumble and suspicions disappear and hatreds cease. Eternal one, by your grace, we accept with joy the life you offer and uh, give you our heartfelt gratitude and thanks. Help us to lay claim to the promise Jesus made to his friends that they would receive power to be his witnesses. Allow us to recognize that power, to be your witnesses to our time and our circumstances. Empower us to be partners with you in creating a world where justice prevails and where love overcomes. Gracious God, Abba, send us out in the power of your spirit to live and serve to the praise and glory of the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
1869, eight women formed a missionary society that would eventually become United Methodist Women. In the early years, the focus was on sending missionaries to change for the better lives of women and girls in foreign lands. Later were added home issues of poverty and child labor and immigration. And still later, family life and racial discrimination and full clergy rights for women. Today, we continue to study and act with integrity on justice issues of our times, issues of homelessness, racial divisions, sex trafficking, threats to our environment, substance abuse, health care, and public education. Who are United Methodist women? Well, we're women like all women in our pews, women of diverse ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds, employed, not employed, housewives, businesswomen, single, married, widowed, divorced, young, middle-aged, mature. Most of us, most of all, we are women committed to mission. We have many opportunities to be in mission through prayer and Bible studies and spiritual retreats, hands-on missions in our, right here in Valdosta, mission education experiences, leadership development, and we support the work with women and children and youth both here and around the world. UMW is the women's ministry of the United Methodist Church, and at FUMC we have five small groups called circles, which meet monthly. And we have at least three new circles for young women starting up. Would everybody who is a member of a circle or a member of the UMW please stand at this time? Thank you. You may be seated. Well, UMW has a long history of honoring someone for their service to improve the lives of others through a special mission recognition. The honorees receive a gold label pen and a certificate, and a monetary gift for missions is given in her name. And today we are pleased to recognize six women. If you will turn around so they can see you receiving your gift. First, longtime tireless workers Laverne Stevenson, being presented her certificate and pin by new member Debbie Haskins. And Phyllis Daniel, being presented by our president, Margaret McCraney. Congratulations. <laughs> now we come to circle leaders who have given of their time and energy faithfully for many years. Linda Miller, Martha Gibson, oh, just a minute, I'll, I'll, yes, you can give. <laughs> Linda Miller being presented by Roxy Corbett. Martha Gibson, who uh, could not be here today, she has a stand-in, Eleanor McGowan, was being presented by Lee Jordan, Evelyn Poindexter, who's being presented by Carol Wink, and Betty Dow Templeson, being presented by new member Betsy Birch. For all of you, we appreciate your dedication to missions. These you see before you are the faces of UMW at First United Methodist Church. And so we honor you, our sisters in Christ, past and present, who inspire us to put faith, love, and, action, and hope in action. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, the rest of us are going to stand up and greet one another in Christian love. I will take children with me over here. So let's greet one another. Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're delighted you're here. We're delighted you can share in warm fellowship with fellow Christians. Welcome to our congregation this day. We continue our worship as we sing 504, The Old Rugged Cross. A lady just told me this week this is one of my favorite hymns, 
and was my family's favorite hymn also. I was delighted to say we're going to sing it on Sunday. And here we are, number 504. Join me in singing The Old Rugged Cross. You may be seated. That's some good singing. Uh, I always feel like if the people of God will sing, the glory of God will come down. Uh, it's, uh, one, that's one of those marvelous hymns of the faith that seems to just reside in our souls. Well, I'll invite the ushers to come forward. This is our time of giving during the service. This is not an interruption to our worship. This is a part of our worship. We count it a privilege to be a part of God's work. Now, while we are here, I want you to know that we have a dozen kids who are 
away from here at St. Simon's Island at our retreat center, Epworth by the Sea. Well, there's a picture of them right there. These kids are on their confirmation retreat. They will be coming to profess their faith in Christ and to become a part of our church family uh, next week. And this is one of the high and holy points of our church year. I want you to know that starting from our nursery, working up through our elementary kids, working up through our mid-highs and senior highs, all along the way, the gifts that you give here to the church go not to babysit these kids, but to help them learn the good news of Jesus Christ, help them to learn the truths that are in the Bible, and help them learn not just about Jesus, but to experience Jesus and to walk with Jesus. So this is always our goal. Never think that what you give is something that is small or insignificant. It calls on us to give our best. It calls on us to give not just of our things, but to give of ourselves. So today, I invite you to give generously. I invite you to give gladly. And I invite you to give recognizing that you are investing in the next generation. Our calling in our generation is to carry the light of Christ that bright torch that has been passed to us, carry it as brightly and as faithfully as we can, but we want to pass it to the next generation so that they can carry that torch so that the world may know that Jesus is Lord. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, let us never think that we are about a small enterprise. We are about something that is world-changing. And if we were silent, the voice of Christ could not be heard in the world. Instead, let us be bold, let us be generous, and let the name of Christ be proclaimed from here to the farthest reaches of the world. Receive these gifts and use them for your kingdom's glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thank you so much, choir, for that beautiful anthem. I wish you all could have been here at 8045 uh, service. Lester sang the anthem by himself. And it was just interesting to see him do all of the parts. He had these little sock puppets, you know, do the woman's part, the men's part. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for that wonderful word. Well, you all have been driving down the road just like I have, and periodically you will see on the front bumper uh, a license plate that has something on it that says, a house divided. And it will have something like Georgia and Georgia Tech. It's kind of sad. Um, or Alabama and Auburn, which is kind of makes you sorry. It's sort of hard to find any upside on that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, you know, we laugh about that stuff when, it, when we deal with universities and football and all that. But you got to stop and think about it. A house divided is a tragedy. It is a crisis just waiting to happen. There's this really interesting story that uh, Luke gives us a lot of detail about, shows up in a couple of the other Gospels. Jesus goes across the lake, and he and his disciples get out of the boat, and they land beside a graveyard. Well, there is this man in the graveyard who is demon-possessed. He is wild and crazy. When he gets calm enough, some of the guys in the neighborhood actually got a hold of him and bound him up in chains. But then all of a sudden when he got, the, the demons just grabbed hold of him again, he'd break the chains. He ran around naked and just created havoc. Everybody stayed away from this guy. So Jesus and his disciples land, and guess who comes running their direction? This guy. Well, every, yeah, that's what they were saying, too. <laughs> ah! and, but the guy comes up, and much to their astonishment, falls on his face before Jesus. And he, he asks for mercy. And Jesus says, what is your name? And those of you who have paid attention in Sunday school, you may remember this. Uh, anybody got the name for me? Legion. I looked up legion in the original Greek. And do you know what it means? Lots. <laughs> no, that's not exactly what, but they're just lot. This guy's got an infestation of demons. He is a house divided. They're ripping him apart this way, that way. And the uh, Jesus, when he finds out the name, says, all right, time for you guys to go. And they say, oh, please don't throw us out of here with nowhere to go. We don't want to just wander out in the spiritual realms. So they say, what about the pigs? And Jesus says, okay, you can go into the pigs. They go into the pigs, and the whole lot just goes crazy, and they run down into the, into the lake and drown. It's a fascinating story, and there's, there's more to it than that. Go back and, and read it after church. But I'm telling you, this is the point I want to bring out. This guy was a house divided. Inside, I think it was uh, E. Stanley Jones who made a comment about a man that he met. He said, he was a walking civil war. You know what he's talking about? I mean, we can look back at our own country, and we've been through a lot of wars, still in, but without a doubt, the most perilous war we have ever been in is what? The Civil War, this was the time at which our whole nation was in danger of just ripping apart. And the question was whether we would remain united or whether we would disintegrate. Would we be a house divided? Well, that, you talk about peril. That was our nation. And today we want to take a look at what it means for us to live with an undivided heart? Or are we people who find ourselves a kind of walking civil war? Well, today, as we've been taking a look at some of the key sermons that John Wesley preached, 
we're going to be taking a look at uh, a particular passage of Scripture. He called this sermon the uh, circumcised heart, a kind of a term that we, not, we don't use as often now, but we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 2, the passage in which he's talking about this idea, but he says, here's the main point he's making. It's not about outward things. It's about a heart that is right and a heart that is seeking after God. So, let's go here to Romans uh, chapter 2. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you're no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. Now, don't you know that among the Jewish believers at that time, that really lit their fire? And they were saying, whoa, what, 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 do, you, what do you mean? Uh, we've been keeping all the outward ritual. And he said, there's nothing wrong with the outward ritual, but that's not the key. You can keep all the outward ritual, but if your heart isn't right, you've missed the whole point. So, here's where he goes on. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be His own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law, but don't obey it. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you've gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law, rather it is a change of heart produced by God's Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. And then we're going to pick up a verse from uh, Proverbs chapter 4, which speaks to the same issue of the heart, and it says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. What an incredible passage that reminds us again of our need to have a heart that is united. As a matter of fact, there's a verse that uh, in, in the King James put it this way from Psalm 86, 11. It says, unite my heart that I might fear you or that I might honor you, that I might love you. Okay, I'm going to ask a hard question and nobody, I'm just astonished, nobody in the early service knew the answer to this. So, I'm asking for raised hands on this. Does anybody here know what a hydromometer is? Jamie knows. And the only reason I know is that growing up in India, we learned something that some of you here in America do not know. Some of you think milk comes from containers. It actually comes from cows. And out in India, they would milk the cows, and they would bring milk around to us each day in a bucket. And here was the deal. You could make more money if you could stretch the milk farther. And the way you do that is you'd literally pour water in, you would water it down, that's our expression that we use, which is why we had a hydromometer. It's sort of like a, a kind of looks like a thermometer, and you stick it in, and if it's filled with water, it floats higher. And so, we, the guys knew that we had this deal, so they tried not to water it down until after they left us and would go to the next customer. They adulterated the milk. You all know what adultery is? I mean, we talk about that in terms of our marriage relationships. It's where you have made a commitment to be faithful to a person, but you back out on that commitment. And you hold on with one hand to that relationship, and then you step into another relationship. It is adulterated. Your heart is divided. Now, some of you won't remember this song, but there are a few of us that remember a song called Torn Between Two Lovers. Do you all remember that one? I mean, that song defines lame. You remember how it goes something, you know, 
torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool. Loving both of you is breaking all the rules. And there's a part of me that only he can fill, but I still love you and drivel wretch. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, I have no idea why that song became so famous and made somebody a million bucks, but life doesn't work that way. Here's a person with a divided heart. You can't love somebody when you've got a divided heart. And so the psalmist said, unite my heart. And that is our call, and that is our prayer today. But there are many who are still people who say, I find myself a walking civil war. So John Wesley said that we need to have a heart that is filled with holiness. So, I want to ask you, in the word holiness, say the first word in that, that's a part of that, okay? Try it with me. Whole. Whole. That's very good. In the first sermon, they said holy. No. Whole is the first part of it. Do you know when we are holy? It's when we are whole. Our whole heart is seeking after God. When our life is whole, that's what our Jewish friends mean when they say shalom. It means may your life be whole. Peace. Peace in every area of your life. May you have joy in your life. May you have health in your life. May you have abundance in your bank account. May you have good uh, everything. May you have hair. (laughs) <laughs> a part that I am still praying on. But there's the idea of holiness. It's whole. We are held together by God. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 6, where He said, seek first the kingdom of God, just give that your whole attention, and then all the other things will be given to you. But if you're chasing after the, all the other things, then you will find yourself divided and scattered. There's a really interesting passage in the Bible, in the, in the Gospels, about John the Baptist. And some of you uh, will say, oh, I'm not sure I remember this part. It's not one of the greatest hits. But there's this place where John has been thrown into prison by Herod. And I'm telling you, their prisons were hell holes. So here's John in the midst of this misery down there. And it, it's dark and dank and, you know, he's suffering And he sends a couple of his disciples to see Jesus. Now, remember, this is John the Baptist. You know, there had not been a prophet for 300 years, and here comes this man of God proclaiming, prepare the the way of the Lord. That John the Baptist. The John the Baptist who baptized Jesus. The John the Baptist who saw the dove coming down on Jesus And said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The John the Baptist who heard the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This John the Baptist sends a couple of his disciples to Jesus and says, "Um, John wants to know, like, are you really the Messiah or is there somebody coming after you? And we might be tempted to think, well, so what happened to John's faith? I'm telling you what happened. The guy was stuck in a pit. And I'm not sure what all he expected when he said that this was the Messiah, but I'm guessing John didn't think that meant he would wind up down in a dungeon. And, of course, not too long after that, off came his head. And so he's saying, Jesus, you know, are are you the one we're looking for? Did I kind of get that wrong? Do do we need you and somebody else? Now, there is the question. Do we need Jesus and? Because there are a lot of us who think, you know, I want Jesus. But I want Jesus and success. I want Jesus and pleasure. I want Jesus and plenty of money in the bank account. I want Jesus and Or is Jesus himself 
enough. And the answer that God wants us to hear clearly is that Jesus is enough. I think this saying comes out of Africa, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. Telling you, when we find ourselves, where all of the other props in our lives have been kicked out, we will discover that Jesus is enough. Now, John Wesley wrote another sermon entitled, The Great Privilege of Those That Are Born of God. And moms and dads, if you've got your kids here, you may need to do a little explaining with them afterwards because I'm going to use two words that are kind of hard for our younger ones to, to grab a hold of. But when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, there are two things that happen. There's something objective and something subjective. There's something God does for us and then something God does in us. So, here's what God does for us. Here's the objective part. It doesn't matter about anything you do. Here's what God has done. When you come trusting in Jesus, what He did for you and me at the cross, when He died on the cross to forgive our sins, that is a completed work. You don't need to do anything else. That is completed. When you ask Jesus to forgive you, your sins are forgiven, period. That is objectively true. So if somebody asks you, are you going to heaven? You can just say, yes. Are you bragging about yourself? No. Who are you bragging about? You're bragging about Jesus. You're saying, I'm, I've trusted Jesus. I'm standing on what He has done for me. That is objective. Okay. Now, here's the subjective part of it. May I see the hands of those who are perfect? among us today. Thank you for not raising your hands. Uh, I, I met one guy who said he had not sinned in 20 years, but then I talked to his wife. Anyway, uh, but no, we're not perfect. But here's the deal. In the eyes of God, when we trust Jesus, we are made perfect. But that is still being worked out in our lives. So we Here's what I want Josh to put up here. Okay, there it is. I am saved. Okay, that's, that's the finished work. But I am being saved. God is still making you and me like Jesus. And then one day when we get to heaven, I will be saved. It, it will be completed. And John Wesley talked about this. I am saved. I am being saved. And I will be saved. Let's say that together. I am saved. I am being saved, I will be saved. So, that's the process that God is working on. At the cross, we are saved. When we ask Jesus to save us, it is a completed work, but it is a completed work when we not only say the words, but we believe. John, uh, excuse me, Romans 10 uh, says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. We are called on not just to say some words, not just to kneel at an altar, not just to say a prayer, but to follow. And when we do that, we are saved, we are being saved, and then in the end, we will be saved. God will complete His work. God is at work making us day by day like Jesus. We always have the power of choice. Remember, what we're talking about is a lifestyle of following after Jesus. If there is anybody here who is content with having said, well, I just prayed a prayer and checked off the box, I want to put a divine discontent in you. I want you to hear God has so much more. He wants not just to take sin out of us. He wants to put Jesus into us. We are, as John Wesley said, going on to perfection. Did you know that when Methodist preachers are uh, ordained, the bishop asks us, are you going on to perfection? Which sounds a little bold and ostentatious, doesn't it? Going on to perfection. But... Brother John, they asked you that same thing too, and what did you say? He said yes, and I heard a bishop one time make a little comment after he asked the, the uh, folks who were being ordained. He said, if you're not going on to perfection, 
What are you going on to? And I thought, what a good question. We are called to go on toward perfection. So, how do we understand that we still sometimes find ourselves in the midst of a, a struggle to follow after God and yet understand that we are saved? Well, here's a little show and tell that I brought. I got a I forgot to bring an umbrella, and I looked in my office, and I had a dirty, nasty one. And I thought, oh, this will not do, but I found this one, the pretty one. Okay, here's the deal. Isn't that cool? You know, I always have a sense of feeling power when I push one of those buttons and it opens up. Anyway, here's the thing. When we trust in Jesus, there may be sin, there's our self-centeredness, there are temptations just raining down all around us. But when we trust in Christ, what He does is brings us under His protection. Now, what did we do to create the umbrella? Nothing. It is a gift. So that is God's completed work. But what do we have to do? stay under the umbrella. What would you think about somebody who in a downpour is doing this? They're just getting drowned. What they need to do is stay under the umbrella. By the way, notice, does the umbrella move? Nope. We move out from under the umbrella. I'm telling you, the grace of God is enough. He has completed the work our part is in obedience to stay under the umbrella. And here's what Wesley wants to say to us today. You and I can ask God to help us keep growing in love so that our desire more and more is to stay here and say, why would we want to go anywhere else? We find that He gives us His heart and we are made people who by grace remain under His care. Now, if we should step out, now John writes in 1 John chapter 1, he says, now I'm, or chapter 2, he says, I'm writing this to you so that you won't sin. Stay under the umbrella. And then he goes on and says, yeah, but if anyone does sin, we have someone who's advocating for us, who's praying for us, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he says, go ask Him for forgiveness. Get back under there. Don't give up hope. Don't quit trying. Get back where God has called you. Now, somebody may be saying, oh, wow, you know, but I think God's really out to get me. I've got good news for you. Satan keeps trying to give us a wrong picture of God, and let me give you the right picture. It is the picture in the story of the prodigal son. Helmut Tillich wrote a sermon years ago that really gave it the right title. It's not the, really the story about the prodigal son. It's the story about the waiting father. You remember the father sitting up on the rooftop, watching, watching. And when the, all of a sudden he sees this bedraggled creature coming down the road, can't, can't recognize him, a long way off. And, but there's something in that walk. Before he can even recognize him, he says, that's my boy. And he runs down off the roof and he runs pell-mell towards him and throws his arm around him and welcomes him home. Listen, that is our God who does not want anyone to be lost but everyone to come back to repentance. And so today, my prayer for you is that you will come to God and then that you will abide in Him. Say, God, I want to follow Jesus. Would you help me? and then abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let's pray together. Father, I like that old hymn that says, I need Thee. Oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. The fact is, we cannot survive apart from You. How many times have we stepped out from under the umbrella of Your grace, Your protection, Your saving grace. And we've just gotten drowned by all of the things outside. 
We need to come again back under your protection, under your saving grace. Help us to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So today, for any of us who have never yet put up the umbrella, would you remind us that Jesus is here to save? And for all of us who have trusted you but find ourselves wandering out, oh, would you give us a heart that says, I want to please my God. I don't want a divided heart. I don't want to be a walking civil war. God, come and unite our hearts that we might love you completely. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to stand with me, and let's sing together our closing hymn. It's um, What Wondrous Love Is This. It talks about the love of God, and I want us to sing just the first and last verses. As you stand, would you let this vision of Christ come into your heart before your eyes with such clarity that you will find a heart that is united to follow after Christ. Let's stand as we sing. Would you join hands with each other? And just as a reminder to ourselves, so we'll recall during this week and let God's Spirit just remind us, how about let's say those three things together, just kind of help us focus. I am saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. So we trust God. We are saved. And yet we are being saved because God is continually working in our hearts and changing us and making us more like Jesus. And then one day we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. So would you walk in God's grace, walk in faith, walk in joy, walk in hope? And as God gives you strength, you will walk in victory. So brothers and sisters, go in God's grace and the grace of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be and abide with you now and forever.